I'm going to ask just to say a few things about myself, and I'll make it extremely brief. Because I've only been here at the university as a chaplain uh, for a brief span of time, at least for now. Uh, one year, actually, just rounded the corner. I've actually, before taking on the position of university chaplain director of religious life, I was an affiliated uh, denominational chaplain um, in partnership with St. Augustine's Chapel over on 24th Avenue, uh, right next to the Tri-Delta House, and uh, worked exclusively with students at that point. Now it's uh, a much different job, and this is one of the venues, kinds of venues that I always look forward to because it is interacting face-to-face uh, -face with students. So anyway, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here, a privilege to be uh, addressing the subject uh, that we're lifting up tonight. I mean, I, I am an ordained United Methodist pastor and am theologically trained, but I don't really know that much about these questions. So <laughs> I'm, I'll be listening uh, and taking notes. I would like to, uh, to introduce our panelists tonight. Um, and the first 30 minutes of this hour will be spent uh, me just raising a few uh, questions that have been prepared, and uh, we can just sort of toss those out and kind of share them in a kind of popcorn style just as, as individuals would like to chime in. And then the last 30 minutes, uh, it, the, the floor is open for you to add questions that have hopefully been uh, provoked or evoked uh, by, by listening in to us. Uh, to my left, far left over here is uh, Professor Scott, not Professor Scott, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just Marissa Scott. Marissa Scott. I don't know why. <laughs> Marissa Scott, uh, who is with the, the Environmental Health and Safety, uh, and dealing a lot with animal safety. Right. Uh, I'm the Animal Care Safety Officer. Uh, I have uh, to my immediate left Professor Robert Norris from our Anthropology Department. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Can you can you do both? Can you do e either field? <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. That, that was um, my first mistake this year, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, Professor Robert uh, uh, Norbert, uh, Norbert Ross from Anthropology. Uh, to my uh, immediate left, Professor Arbach, who is in the art department, and then Professor John Locks, who has uh, been a philosophy professor here since 1967, and uh, it's on sabbatical, so we're thankful that you're here to join us tonight and take some time off. And uh, then Michael Rose, uh, who is at Blair School of Music and uh, is a composer. Uh, as, we, as we consider the questions that have been uh, part of this ongoing uh, Kepi project, uh, Living Before Dying, uh, was asked right off the bat to consider two questions, and I've actually kind of bracketed them together. Uh, what is life, and what is the meaning of life? Uh, now, my first response as I throw this out to our panelists is simply, uh, is, as, I, as I consider this, as a, as a minister who, who often deals with these questions homiletically, and uh, for years and years, uh, I would think about these and other questions through what's called the lectionary, which would be just assigned readings uh, from both the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. Uh, if I think about myself, at least, the, uh, the way in which the essence of life is boiled down into the teachings, at least of, of, of Christ, he said that as he, he, he came not only to give life, but to give life abundantly. And so I think that the question about what is life just in a biological sense and then what is the meaning of life, which has to do more with the, the complexity and the beauty uh, and the vitality of life, that those are certainly coextensive, but not always linked together. And so, uh, you know, I would like to, to think about that in terms of what is being alive, that is this deep connection that we have with just being embodied biological creatures. And is that more essential than this abstract question, which is it's at least often abstract, about the meaning? Um, 
I was I just recall today as I was thinking about these questions, a conversation that uh, that many of us listened in on some 25 years ago or more, at least some of us here. Um, <coughs> Joseph Campbell, who was a mythologist, came out with uh, the, the Power of Myth, and it was on a Bill Moyer show. And I remember him saying, and it's always stayed with me, so it must have been important all these years, uh, that he began by saying, as he kicked off this series on, uh, on the uh, Power of Myth, uh, that he felt that what was, what was a primary concern in modern life had less to do with discovering its meaning and more to do with the rapture of being alive. And, uh, and so I think we're going to hopefully explore both of those concerns of, of, of meaning, a philosophical, psychological, intellectual, aesthetic meaning that we attribute to life, and also this, this, this sense of just being acutely alive in, 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 as, as sentient uh, biological creatures who uh, can find great pleasure and depth of connection uh, to the creation that we're a part of. So I'd like to look at both of those. So I've exhausted my repertoire. So gentlemen, what would be the meaning of life as well as <clears throat> the connection that such a meaning will have with just the question of existence itself. <laughs> it's open. All right. So uh, the difference between life and a lack of life <coughs> is the difference between my sweater and me. I pick up the sweater, the sweater doesn't pick me up. The sweater is dead, <coughs> unmoving unless I push it. So life is essentially activity. That's what it is. Activity of a variety of sorts. Uh, we are self-moving beings so long as we're alive. Self-moving. Uh, sweaters are not. <coughs> Tables are not. All right, that's one. So the meaning of life is, what's wrong with just saying this? Performing activities that you enjoy, performing them well, and enjoying them. That's the meaning. Yeah, and I would add to this that this before, uh, the self moving, that part of our biological being is, of course, also this meaning making machine in our head, right? So that it's not sep we cannot separate these things. So the, the emotions that we feel, the questions we're asking, I mean, they're part of our, our biological endowment, right? Where do these questions come from? They come from how we go through life, how we work with life, how we work, how our cognitive apparatus works. And so it's a lot, and I guess a lot of these questions about meaning come exactly from these trying to understand things like emotions that we, we have, we know about them, we know that we're in love, we know that we are angry or what else ever, but it's hard to understand them. And I think that's where then these questions of me, larger meanings come from. But I think essentially it's about this yeah, living life and all these emotions just as much, because they're not different from, our, from the rest of our body, right? That's one and the same. Thing that work together there. And Professor Rose, I know you work in the, a lot in the world of <coughs> tonality, the tonality of life. How, how is meaning crazy. communicated through tonality? Well, uh, I'm going to, actually, I'm going to talk about Christ for a moment. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm Jewish, so I don't know anything about Christ. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the, the New Testament's a pretty good book. Um, you know, good read. And I think when um, Jesus talked about love, you know, or actually Paul, parentheses, but Jesus mm -hmm. begins with, I, I think, I, I, I do think that activity, you mentioned love, I think a lot of, to me, just has to do with not just activity, but desire. <laughs> I think desire is really important. I, I think it takes so many shapes. Um, we, we, we are creatures who want things. And when we're infants or toddlers or like my six-year-old boy, that wanting is just enormous and, and uncontrollable and sometimes really, really painful. But when you're 54 
which I just turned yesterday. Yep, happy birthday. Um, <laughs> it, can, it can still be painful. It can still be painful. And I think, I'm not sure what, what the philosophical perspective on this is. You know, there's so many responses to desire. One is to just try to, you know, squash it, you know? Or, but then there's another school of thought that might say that, well, you shape it into some sort of ethical behavior. But I really think it comes down to just wanting things and figuring out what that means. And, and, and so it's not just enjoying activities, but it's being aware that your activities have consequences. Um, and maybe that's part of a definition of life, <coughs> it is figuring out what it means to love what you're doing, but also to realize that the thing that you're doing affects everybody. It's like the George Bailey effect. You know, remember George Bailey? It's a Wonderful Life? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like he decides, you know, mm -hmm. to find out what it's like never to have been born. It's just so crazy to think that someone who's a nobody has had such an impact. And you don't even realize it. So wanting things. I think music is a living, yeah, it's not a table or a sweater, and it's not a human <coughs> being, but I have to say, John, I think music is a living being. <laughs> It, it, it's something that is alive. Mm -hmm. It's not just mm -hmm. the fact that it affects living beings. I think it has a life of its own, which, is, which surpasses anyone's individual understanding. Of course, it comes from a human being and, and a life devoted to making music. I'll play Mozart a little later on. But so, you know, what does it mean to define your activities and your desires in such a way that you are aware of their impact on other human beings? That's a huge ethical enterprise, which religions have tried to address and philosophy has tried to figure out, and nobody has figured it out. And we all make such terrible mistakes. And I would say that life is defined by making mistakes. Making mistakes, so many mistakes, and owning up to them, learning from them, and not being afraid to make them. That was exactly the point I was going to raise in conjunction with the next question, which has to do with what are the major components of having a fulfilling life. Um, I know you're a big Beatles fan, Michael, so I thought... Tell me that, why. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but it's a, it's a line from John Lennon right before he died, actually, that said, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. And I think that the, the life that happens oftentimes are the failures uh, that, that we encounter uh, and, the, and, and even the disillusionments. And that, that, that those are the very things that help us to, to really yearn uh, for, the for, for the things that are yet fulfilled. Um, and so, so failures can be uh, tremendous gifts. Uh, my own sense of, of direction as a, as a young adult before entering into undergraduate studies uh, was, was shaped <coughs> by two years of just working under my father's tutelage to be sort of the extension of himself that I was never meant to be. And it was a total failure. And it was a, it was a wonderful lesson for me. And so there's a, there's a, a what's called apophatic theology, uh, which simply says that we know what God is by first knowing what God is not. And I think that that can be also applied to just uh, to, to our own lives is that we often find out what it is we need to be about in this world by discovering many times uh, over again what we don't need to be doing. And so the, our, the failures that come away are, are oftentimes gifts. So that's at least one of the components uh, of having a fulfilling life. But I'd like to turn to people to our left to chime in from art, from the arts and the well, I'm not nearly as articulate as these people, so I need, <laughs> I need to speak in terms of anecdote. Now, for me, the, uh, I break this down into two parts, one being the biological, that, you know, I, I'm getting old. I'm at 60 now, Michael. Uh, <laughs> but, like, this summer, I broke my arm and didn't even know it. Two days later, it swells up, and I didn't find out I broke it. But you start becoming aware of sort of your mortality in a physical sense. Um, Back in 1984, I was shot at on my way to an exhibition in Morgantown, West Virginia. Somebody was on the highway, and it, it hit my trailer. I heard it, but if you <coughs> figure a vehicle going 50 miles an hour, and the bullet was literally in my head, head high, and it lodged in my trailer. But, you know, you have these moments. Um, and then uh, getting more to the questioning about what life is in general, uh, 
my dad is a real tough love, was a real tough love kind of advocate. And I flunked out of college my freshman year. I flunked out of the University of Kansas, now I'm a full professor here. What does any of this mean? But anyway, um, uh, so, <laughs> I got the tongue lashing from Professor D and that I told some parents that and he overheard it. But um, um, I flunked out and I, you know, I had a whole speech prepared when he came home and all he said was, how does it feel? And then I waited about an hour later, we had dinner, and I said, Dad, I'm gonna lose my deferment. I'm gonna probably end up in Vietnam. And he just goes, when your time's up, it's up. Well, my, my dad, was, <laughs> when he, I mean, my dad was at Anzio and Monte Cassino and there were Peter, he was a very, very bad stuff in World War II. And he just kind of had that, I mean, I'm from Kansas, we had tornadoes all the time. We didn't have a basement. He didn't go running through, you know, he said, well, when the time's up, it's up. Um, so, <laughs> so, again, the biological, which I'm becoming more and more aware of uh, about mortality. And I guess when the time comes when Michael plays his music, I'll show some slides, but I've done several pieces that deal with that, um, and I can show you. Um, I would like to get back to um, what you were saying about, you know, we make lots of mistakes <coughs> in our lives. And uh, how we deal with that is also part of life. Do we pick up, carry on? Do we learn from those, or do we just drown in our own mistakes and sorrows? Um, and when I read the questions that were going to be posed to us tonight, it made me think of this book that I did my homework with. Um, it's called Man's Search for Me. It's by a man named Victor Frankel. Uh, he was a psychiatrist that went to Auschwitz uh, during World War II. And it's all about how um, he prevented himself from drowning in sorrow and suffering and was able to rise above uh, and survive living through the Holocaust and helping those around him to survive as well. Um, he had written a manuscript and had brought it with him to the concentration camp and, and he would worked on this for over a decade and they took it through in the trash. All of his, his, you know, basically essentially his life's work just thrown in the trash. So he dedicated himself to rewriting that manuscript on little slips of paper whenever he could. He found purpose in that. And so his theory is that having a purpose in life gives your life meaning. And uh, he said there are several different things that can give your life meaning, that can give your life a purpose. Um, he saw three possible sources for meaning. In work, doing something significant. In love, caring for another person. And in courage during difficult. There are probably many more reasons than that, but when I read these questions, it just struck me how personal they all are to each person. It's very hard to define for everyone what life might mean, but we all find our own way and our own purpose. And that was, that, that's what makes it meaningful to me. Well, as we roll this around, once again, meaning, purpose, um, one of our questions explicitly uh, you know, confronts us with the question of religion or the lack thereof uh, in our lives and that what role does religion take or should it take in determining uh, our living. And I'm reminded of the phrase uh, homo religiosus. Uh, it's the idea that, that human existence is inherently religious. And there are many thinkers who, uh, who have posited this notion Hegel, Kierkegaard, William James, uh, Eric Fromm, Paul, Paul Tillich, even Langdon Gilkey, Gilkey who, who taught uh, here at Vanderbilt Divinity School uh, way back in the day. And it has to do, this, this idea of formula religiosis, uh, less to do with uh, institutional commitments or creedal beliefs. It can include that. But it has to do with our, our drive uh, as human beings or transcendence, towards freedom, towards meaning making in the world uh, that, that makes us essentially religious in nature. So I'm positing that notion and to see what other people's responses would be to the question of whether uh, human beings are indeed homo religiosus. It is a personal matter. Uh, I, I know a lot of people who have no meaning in their lives independently of the religious beliefs they have. <coughs> I 
know some people who seem to get by quite nicely without any religion. They write books about atheism. <laughs> now you 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 might uh, you might say, well, their religion is to beat up on people who are religious. Uh, at least that's their ideology. Uh, maybe so, but I think but, but I think when when all is said and done, uh, you, you've got you've got to say you have to open up as as several of our colleagues here said, you have to open up and do the best you can in engaging in the activities that make sense to you, uh, believing the things that make sense to you, uh, acting in accordance with those beliefs when that makes sense to you. Uh, and, and it's very difficult and I think quite unjust uh, for somebody to say, you're an idiot because you're religious. You know? um, one particular philosopher, <coughs> a friend of mine, is of the opinion that uh, uh, people who don't take religion seriously are the brights which of course means that people who take religion seriously are the assholes or the darks. Uh, this is, uh, this, this, this is uh, quite unwarranted. I, I think the more we allow <coughs> a variety of religions and non-religions to thrive, the better off we are as human beings. From anthropology and studying an, uh, indigenous uh, cultures, how would you Square with this notion of homo religiosus. Where do you see that? Well, I, I teach actually religion class here at Vanuva. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm one of these the non, uh, non religious people that do not necessarily thrive on bashing religious people. But I think there's a natural propensity for having religious beliefs, which I think basically quite logically can be explained. But I think part of this is, uh, I, mean, I want to combine just the, the question before. When, when you ask in the, in the United States or the Western world in general, you ask people, well, draw me, make a drawing of your life. What you normally get is some kind of a, a line, sort of an uphill line, right? And with up and up meaning it's gonna get harder, it means we're getting better. And I think within all these ideas, what you get then is like, oh, we learn from our mistakes. So kind of these, these sayings, oh yeah, we're getting better, we're improving our, after our mistakes. And it, but it's only within this idea that we actually even define them as mistakes. Instead, when you do this in other cultures, you don't get this idea of my life is sort of this ongoing uphill improve, constant improvement, but my life is just what it is. This is who I am, and this I do whatever I do, and I do it right. So if I fall in love, I fall in love, and I do this, and I don't think about anything else. And if I'm heartbroken, I'm heartbroken. I'm enjoying it in the sense of being heartbroken, right? And I think that's sort of part of this doing these right things. When it, what gives us fulfillment, we're not ending, and we're not sort of, we're planning a lot. I mean, you look at these, the, the exhibit, and there's a lot of these bucket lists. I mean, since about 1999 or so, we get all these ideas of bucket lists. It's actually a fairly new concept. Mm -hmm. And it's all about what do you want to do in the future. It's sort of this, yeah, kind of John Lansing, right? We do the things in the future, but what we don't do is kind of like being here instead of saying, oh, this was a mistake, and so sort of let's learn from this. No, it was not a mistake. It's, that's exactly what I'm doing right now. This is my life right now, and there's, I don't need anything else beyond that. And so just doing these right things and doing the things that I'm doing right, and so with this passion of living these emotions that I have that I might not be able to explain, or I can explain them uh, chemically, most of the time. But just, I think that gives this idea of fulfillment where religion tend, very often they answer these bigger questions without really answering them. them right? It's not that we have complete answers at the end. So. I know a lot. I mean, I grew up Catholic, and it cost me half of my life so far to get rid of my guilt trip that was sort of installed <laughs> in the beginning. I'm, I'm much better off without this guilt trip. I don't need it. I don't need it as a moral code. I have a strong moral code, but I don't need some kind of a constant threat over my head. Right? Yeah, you said that uh, half my work with students over the last 20 years has been, well, one half is to help uh, some students recover their traditions, and the other have to recover from their traditions. <laughs> I'm the other half. <laughs> <laughs> and so it is a two-edged sword. Yeah, well, um, it, it, as, art, as articulate as your, uh, as your colleagues, I, I don't, I feel totally incoherent. <laughs> I mean, I sure, I'm sure I am. Still so I will continue my incoherence <laughs> and, and tell you all that, um, an anecdote, anecdote. Uh, my favorite student of all time is a passionate Christian, 
and, and, and I'm a secular Jew, whatever the hell that means. Uh, and, and somehow we found a way to talk to each other and love each other, care about each other without you know, this chasm between us having any impact on that relationship. So uh, I just think we're basically <coughs> homo lovo. <laughs> you know, I think that's what we are if we just think about, you know. And you know, it's funny, I don't think artists, composers, I think our advantage, our mishukas, which is Yiddish for craziness, is, is that we just work, we just work. It's all we do, it's all we care about. I don't even think it's purpose, you know. Unfortunately, you know, we, didn't, we should have gone to Auschwitz, Michael and I, but we didn't. <laughs> And one of the reasons why Frankel had to come up with this stuff is because he was there. And, and so we're lucky enough, in some sense, not to have to deal with the meaning of life because we weren't in Auschwitz. But on the other hand, it's, it's, you know, it's a curse not to know what it means to be that despairing because you can't really understand what other people suffer unless you experience it yourself. And that's a serious ethical problem, too. Um, I guess in answer to Frankel, I would propose Paul Ceylon, a great poet who was also in the camps, the death camps, and <coughs> wrote the most important poetry about the Holocaust, the Shoah, afterwards. And he killed himself. He, he killed himself. He threw himself off a bridge in, in Paris. And, and he just couldn't stand it anymore. And so what, what business do we have reading the poetry of someone who was so despairing about his life after Auschwitz that he committed suicide. But I tell you that having read Frankel in Ceylon, Ceylon is much more meaningful to me than Frankel um, <laughs> because Ceylon knows that, that, that the meaning of life is impossible. <laughs> there's no possible way when there's so much suffering. There's no way. You just have to work. You have to work. Um, and, and that's how you get past the stupid religious differences. And that's why Shelby and I could have such a deep friendship, because we were working together. And that's all that matters. And there's no way you would kill yourself if you just remember that, how much work you have to do. That's all. Well, being brought up Jewish, the, I was just brought up in a pretty strict home, kept kosher and all that. Um, uh, I'm sort of glad that in Judaism that God's left to be something of an abstraction, no body, shape, or form. Because I got, I got to tell you, if if I was growing up thinking there was some kind of spiritual entity out there that had body, shape, and form, I don't think I could have bought into it. That I, you know, if I want, I've been in enough situations. You know, the statistical odds of my being at my mother's bedside when she died, at my father's bedside when he died, and then I gave my girlfriend her last meal, and I was all over the country during this period, you know, that I would be there. I mean, that's, that's, it just shouldn't have happened, but it did, and, and so I have sort of this, I don't know what you call it, I mean, you want to call it karma, whatever. I do believe there's some kind of guiding power, call it what you want, but I'm, if, if it was put in terms of the human being, I, I'm not sure where my head would be. Does that sound stupid? No, it's very profound. Oh, well, okay. No, I mean, <laughs> what you described, it, it made me think of, of, of uh, I believe it's Carl Jung's whole idea of, of synchronicity and how that, that in, in, in terms of spirituality, that life uh, is connected by things that are meaningfully associated rather than causally connected. And and so that's those are meaningful associations that happened as you were able to be in each of those bedsides and places to think that there's some grand design in which you're being pushed around. No, that's, 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 kind, of, that's kind of creepy. Yeah, it is creepy. Uh, but to see that these things as meaningfully connected, <coughs> then that's the spiritual uh, aspect of it. And I guess on Michael, I, think that I don't want to get too far into this because I probably could go about one sentence and realize I don't know what I'm talking about. But in terms of the suffering, even when you, and I had Hebrew school teachers that were in the camps, and I even had one teacher that was a partisan. He was, he was in Poland and he spent his entire youth in the woods blowing up German things, blowing up Russian things. 
he had a real bitter upbringing. But they, some of these people near the ends of their lives, even as much as they went through, did things that were horrible in daily life, like buying stolen merchandise. You know, you think after someone had lived through all that, and then when they get into their, and they had a beautiful family, made gazillions of bucks, and still were engaged in illegal activities late in life. You know, I just, you would think that kind of suffering would bring you to a different place, but I'm not sure it does. Um, so I don't know if there is a relativism that goes, you know, with this level of suffering. So, I don't know. Well, that's what I mean. Suffering, all bets are off when it comes to suffering. You know, it's, it's just, there's no way of, it, it, you can't explain it. There's no way of justifying Until it. Until you're in their shoes, right. It, it just is. You, you can't justify I'm sorry, Christians. There's no redemption for it. You just have to accept it. Yeah. But I, I'm, I respect the fact that Christians believe that there is redemption for it. It, it makes so much sense. It gives so much meaning. But just because you, that one doesn't believe in that doesn't mean that our lives are meaningless. No, and, I, and I actually, I mean, it as, as a practitioner of the Christian faith, I find that the, the, the real meaning, the real human meaning at least, is through sharing in the, the passion of Christ, as it were, that is in the suffering in whatever way is possible. Uh, more so than uh, certainly uh, the, Christ, the Christian faith is predicated upon the resurrection, but uh, I've been able to live in tension with the fact that we're still very much in a Good Friday world. Mm -hmm. The key word is good, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I gotta say something about this. There's, there's a lot of darkness going on here. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna ask <laughs> I did it for you, and, John. And the question well, of death is coming up next. So, I mean, how are we going to... Well, we're yeah. already there. We're guilty of suffering. Some of our religion on the first day. Terrible <laughs> things are happening. <laughs> terrible things are happening. Now, I'm not denying that terrible things happen. But don't live there. If you can avoid terrible things, avoid them. Don't seek things to be guilty about. Don't, don't do things that, uh, that you know are the wrong things to do, and you're going to be so damn sorry for it. Try to live without regrets. I think that is the key. <coughs> and if you if you do that, you'll have many sunny days. You don't have to be going around leading the wild boars. Uh, you you can you can actually have a good time in life. I hope you will. Talking about supper. Good time talking about supper. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> You 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 are the most I, you you are the you are the most amazingly cheerful supper. Thanks. <laughs> I'm going to wait. Mozart is my answer to you. We'll wait. Mozart okay. is the answer to everything. I agree. <laughs> so, I was saying, yeah, we're talking about religion on the first date here. We haven't had even had a chance yet. <laughs> it's not an easy topic to discuss. Um, I was born and raised Catholic. I'm not practicing. My parents go to church. They're not very strict. Um, it did shape my life in that you know, it gave me some sense of moral values and probably an <coughs> overactive sense of guilt <laughs> and conscience. Um, I, I've learned in my life that you know, I can be happy without going to church every Sunday, and that works for me. Um, I believe in a higher moral code and, and a higher being. Um, but you know, I haven't really explored in my own life what exactly that means yet. I don't think if I do, I'll find many answers either. But I agree, just doing what, what you feel is right. Um, what you enjoy doing, the activities you enjoy doing, uh, and not doing things that you regret. That, that, that has added to my life immensely. So it's a good code to follow. It's time for us now to sort of segue into your questions. Uh, every question I've raised has just taken us further into the abyss. So, <laughs> so maybe, maybe, maybe you can help us out. <laughs>
contributes to your idea of what it means to live. Any medical emphasis here? <laughs> I'm surprised. Is it in Genesis it talks about uh, God breathed life into Adam, which I always thought meant um, unless it can survive on its own breathing, then it's it's not viable. And I'm surprised that in the, the sort of Christian community that hasn't risen to be a major argument. That they're trying to use science to go down to the the fetus level. And now I think some of the right wing wingers want to change the 14th Amendment mm -hmm. to where mm -hmm. um, the fetus is actually a full blown person, I guess, for lack of a better mm -hmm. way of saying it. Which I always thought was weird because then if they use sonograms, is that an invasion of privacy? Yeah. You know, or can uh, we start collecting Social Security nine months early? <laughs> you know. Oh, 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 oh! Because <laughs> when does when is, <laughs> so you're saying when does the clock start? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm surprised it didn't get any cachet to the way the Old Testament's written. What is the it, what is the Hebrew word? Is it ruach? Ruach. Ruach. Yeah. So it is. It's the you have to breathe when you ruach. say it. It's like that's. It's acting out the verse that Michael was talking about. <laughs> wow, that's, what a political question, my goodness. I mean, I, I would, philosopher 101. <laughs> Philosophers know when to duck. <laughs> well, we can give you the Jewish version of this. That the kid remains in Judaism, the kid's a fetus until it finishes medical school. Well, we, we haven't even started it. Yet. I, I, I think you deserve an answer. I'll, I'll just say there's, it's so complex. It's so complex, it has to do with so many political dimensions. And so much of it has to do with the definition of political freedom. It has to do with, for those of us who call ourselves liberals, it has to do with the autonomy of the woman who's bearing a child. And to weigh that against whatever is happening at the level of the fetus. And it's, it's a terrible, terrible, terrible decision to have to make. And there's no way that people are ever going to agree on it. And that is what it means to be alive. <laughs> That we're never going to agree on it. Do you understand? That's what it means to be alive. Now, I call that pleasure. Some people call that suffering. Depends on which end of the discussion you are. True. But no, I, I think it can be so pleasurable that life is so complex. And there's no possible answer to your question. That's being alive. Realizing that your answer to the question is one answer to the question. And you have no right to impose your answer on another person. And that makes it extremely easy because that's the only right answer, right? There is no no one else. I mean, there is no Old Testament, New Testament, any other religion you go to to ask it, where you look at different definitions, whether life is after you're named your person or it's the fetus or whatever. So at the end of the day, yeah, it's your decision and how you feel about it, right? This is what your idea is. And this idea comes part of, sure, from the environment where people tell. But I think what's well, really important that we are not just searching then for some authorities. I think that's a part of going on there. We're looking for meanings to where we're going to turn to. We turn to religion. We we look for an answer for abortion. We turn to religion. Um, but I think at the end, it's your decision, and there's only one right decision. And I'm think I'm absolutely for. I'm a very liberal person on these things. However, when my daughter was when my my ex-wife was pregnant with my daughter, when this question came up, what would we do? There was no doubt in my and, but there was a very personal decision that had nothing to do with morals or, well, it had a lot to do with morals, but not with sort of societal morals or with a religion or anything. It was a very personal decision between back then my wife and me that doesn't matter what's going to happen, we're not going to have abortion. And so it's a very personal decision, and politically, my opinion is it should stay that way. Unfortunately, everyone agrees with this way. But I think part of the problem is that we delegate our meanings to old books. We delegate our meanings to other people, to authorities, to religions, instead of sort of saying, okay, what is it I want? What, what do I think feels right? 
a lot of morality, I mean, I don't need religion to be a moral person. I don't need a religion to have a moral standard. I don't need a religion to have a really good gut feeling about what is right and what is wrong. We look around the world, it doesn't matter what religion we're looking at, people have very good common sense understandings of what's right and what's wrong. So there's no other people with weird religions that eat their neighbors or eat whatever other person. But that doesn't happen. There's not, no one who thinks stealing is just right. There's no problem to this. So it doesn't matter which religion you're looking at, which also means even if you have people that are not religious, you don't have to tell them killing your neighbor or eating your neighbor is a bad thing or stealing is a bad thing. No, you don't have to. You don't have to. Right? And so I think a lot of this is, yeah, at the end it comes down, it's very complex, a lot of different opinions. It makes it really easy. There's no right way of answering other than what you yourself find out for yourself. Usually I don't get stage fright, but right now my heart is kind of going because it's more of a personal question. Um, my best friend took his life back in high school towards senior year, and um, he never really gave off this impression that he was unhappy at all. But um, and oftentimes, even towards the end of his life, he made several references to how blessed he felt. He had many friends who uh, loved him, and his family members all loved him. He was towards the top of his class. He had a lot of things going for him. But um, uh, when he ended his life, he left several notes behind. One for his parents, one for me, I was his best friend. Um, and in his note, he detailed, he explained to me why um, he did what he did. Um, he said that he recognized that his life was blessed and that many people would be happy to live his life. However, he didn't have that basic desire to live that a lot of us have. Uh, for a lot of us, it's easy to find um, a sort of a meaning or at least to want to continue living is a very natural thing. We have this basic impulse that we want to live. But for whatever reason, he explained that he did not have that, in addition to the amount of pain that he was going through because of his depression. Um, he recognized that he had depression, and he recognized that perhaps it was a treatable thing. But because he did not have a basic desire to live, and because of the amount of pain he was going through, he decided he did not want to continue living, even if treatment was an option in several years of happiness. Uh, may lie ahead of him. So what I wanted to ask is, if you were in my position back then, and you had known what would happen to him, and you had known what it was going through his mind at the time, what might you have said to him? So that, let me answer with a very personal anecdote myself, which actually happened about that age of a younger brother. But I was 17, 18. So when I was 18, I was in a very similar situation. I was about to take my life. And so I took my dog, I walked into the forest, and I decided I'm going to kill myself. And as I was going ready to get everything, get everything I mean, lined up, everything, it was this incredible liberation. So this, it gave me this complete power over my life that now I can, I was in complete power. I mean, I could take my life or I couldn't. And it was this incredible liberation moment that gave me this kind of uh, control over my life. I said, okay, there's no one else is telling me what to do. I can do from now on, I can do whatever I want. Because if it doesn't work out tomorrow, I can kill myself. It doesn't work out. So you walk away from this, in, I walked away from this in an extremely exhilarating way of realizing this power that I have over my own life. And that has changed over my life a lot. Because a lot of these, I don't feel this, this need for living, I feel a lot of this, this need for holding on to life. I think it's part of this not feeling life. Why do people cut themselves? Like they cut themselves because they don't feel life. It's not that they're, they're, they want the pain, but the pain makes them feel living. Mm -hmm. And I kind of disagree actually with some of this. I think it's much easier in, in life where, where there's a lot of suffering. It's much easier to hold on to things. I think it's much harder sometimes in a situation where you have everything. I go out and buy something. I get a new iPod, well, I get a new iPhone. Eventually it gets boring, right? So how many new iPhones can I buy? It's not fulfilling, then I might become a CEO, and it's really funny to make a lot of money. But eventually it's kind of, yeah, what else is there? I think in these times where there's really these times of crises, right? They're not mistakes to learn from. I think that's where we feel who we really are, right? I mean, enjoy, uh, yeah, heartbreaks, terrible. I mean, you're, feel completely lost, they're horrible, but it's like the incredible joy of feeling life at that point, right? 
And I think that's what this all is about. I don't need someone tell me, well, after death, there's something else coming. Then I just postpone everything once more, right? And I'm planning for everything else while I'm not living. And I think, but it's this kind of taking control of your life by saying, this is what I do. This is who I am, right? And yeah, go out and do and enjoy what you're doing and do it right. And not big things. I mean, it doesn't have to be big things, but really focusing on this right now. This is what I'm living. And, and taking control of this life and change except that aspect, right? That life, not just something that flows away and eventually you get into high school, you get into a nice college, become a professor and have children, eventually you save, and then of course tuition hits you hard. And if you retire and then eventually, yeah, you turn around with, I mean, think about all these issues, midlife crisis, what is this an expression of for 40 years life has been flowing away, you had no control over your life in terms of things that really matter to you. You know, the, uh, <coughs> Much as we live in society, and we're friends, and we have loved ones, we live a private life inside our heads. And that private life is not accessible to anybody else unless you yourself reveal yourself. Now, obviously, your friend didn't reveal himself to you. And therefore, there was no way that you could have known what he was contemplating. To me, the key <coughs> question here is not what you could have said, because there was no chance for you to say anything since he didn't tell you what distress he was in. The key question is, will you feel guilty about it the rest of your life? And there I would say, don't go there. Don't go there because it's not your fault that he did this, and it would have been your fault had you not done anything, had you known, but you didn't know, and you couldn't do, and therefore, this is the past that's to be left behind. And so I, to add to this, even if there is, the, even if he would have told you, and you tried to do something, depression is a very, very serious thing to overcome. So there's very little you sometimes can do. So even if he would have told, and you would have tried to do something, uh, there's no guilt on your part. There's no, so even if someone tries, and you can try as hard, and you can be a trained psychologist on medic and with medication, everything, it doesn't work out necessarily, right? So. I have just one <coughs> anecdote that I can tell from, from my experience uh, uh, of walking for 10 years with, uh, with a woman here in the state of Tennessee who's on death row. Uh, I was, uh, <coughs> was trained to do a prison visitation program and it soon got escalated into a death row visitation opportunity through a post uh, conviction uh, attorney's office here in town and uh, I got brought in on this case uh, as a third party uh, even though I'm an ordained minister the attorney just wanted me to be able to sit down with this woman who's on death row because she was trying to waive her constitutional <coughs> appeals uh, she, at the time, she was in her early 20s, and she simply wanted to uh, to wave all that aside and to and to ask the court to set an execution date as soon as possible. And so it took it took me a few, a, a few months, really, and it, thankfully it was a long, drawn out process. Uh, it took me a few months to convince her that I wasn't there to try to convince her otherwise, but that I was there simply. Uh, not only at the behest of her attorney, but just to be a third party who could who could hear her out and maybe help her think about the unintended consequences uh, of, of that act if she so decided to go through with it. And I'll never forget something she said to me, um, and it gave me a, a lot of respect for her and a sense of humility and a sense of personal ignorance because I, I could not completely Put myself there but could, could understand it at least and she said this she said she asked a question have you ever been in a movie and as uh, as the story got underway it was such a poorly made movie movie and so, so badly scripted that you knew where this movie was going long before it got to the end and you got up and walked out of the theater and I said well yeah I, I think I have done that and she said well that's my life she said, I know where this movie's going, and I'm getting up, and I'm walking out. And 
And so it took me a while to just talk with her, and I don't know that I fully convinced her. She did eventually uh, uh, draw back from that, but it was uh, at least me tried to help her maybe imagine that she, she still had some editorial control of that script. Um, I wasn't so sure that I, I'd be all that convincing, but uh, and she was also later, within a, in the next couple of months, diagnosed probably, <coughs> as bipolar and got on some medication to help her to kind of think about it a little bit from a diff, little different angle in terms of psychopharmacology. So, all I can say is the best we can do as we, as we relate to others who, who are in peril like that is to know that, that we're there to support them whatever choices they make. I respected her freedom to make that choice. I didn't want her to make that choice. Uh, but I also wanted her to know that she had some freedom that maybe she had, uh, had, had sort of written off. I agree with you that suffering actually makes us feel more alive as does joy and pleasure, that the real problem is indifference or just, what's the, what's the word? Inanition. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> to me, I'm trying to get to Mozart here, and he's not the solution to your problem, but he it does raise a question about, I guess I would just call it imagination. I don't think your friend could never, in his condition, have imagined what you're suffering now. And you're suffering now. And you have had, retrospectively, to imagine what he was suffering. And I think <coughs> it's that compassionate imagination which is so mysterious, especially in the hands of great artists, because that's their capacity. And that's how art can help. It can't necessarily save us. But I don't say that Mozart would have saved your friend, but I think Mozart can help you. I am an evangelist, as a Christian would be. <coughs> that it's a, it's a matter of being so mindful of what another person suffered or is suffering that you know your life has changed forever. And not ruined, not ridden with guilt, but you can, you can make your imagination work in such a way that that you know that your friend is still having an impact on you. <laughs> because now you know what he suffered, and now you realize that he could not have known what you're suffering. But you will never, ever make that mistake about another human being not to let them know what you're suffering, <laughs> if you're suffering that badly. You won't do that to someone else, will you? <laughs> you can't, because the imagination has to extend to other people. And that's what Mozart does. That's what he does. Listen to what he does. There's a high voice. and a low voice, and one in the middle that won't stop. They're talking to each other. They're listening. They're trying to figure out how to talk to each other. And then something marvelous happens. You hear that? It's so beautiful that it's what I'm talking about, John, that somehow the line between suffering and joy, when you're really alive, is paper thin. It's not just enjoying yourself, it's realizing that your joy and your pleasure is completely wrapped up with something that is so mysterious and painful because that's life. And he wrote that when he was 16! <laughs> and the, the idea that you could actually do something, that's the mystery that we have in us. Yeah, he was an exceptional human being, but he was just a human being. 
We all have in us at that age a capacity for such complexity. And all we have to do is have the imagination to let it out into the world, to work so that it comes out into the world so that other people can hear it, whatever it is. And that's what your friend couldn't do. I'm so sorry. But you can. We're fortunate to have a very diverse group of people up there um, with diverse fields and diverse experiences. I want to know, um, Teacher Palace, how has your life and your living influenced your specific fields? And how, ha and how has your fields experience influenced your life? I'll go first. <laughs> uh, so I'm in the safety field. Um, I got into safety about five years ago, and uh, I did that because I really wanted to help people. Um, I try to make the world a safer place and protect lives and protect people from getting hurt. And to me, that's one of the most important things that a person can do, so that's really something I wanted to do. In the safety field, I like to say that uh, a good day is one where nothing exciting happens. <laughs> there's something exciting going on, something's going horribly wrong, and you know, there's something that we have to do and fix. So it's affected my life and that I feel like uh, I have more purpose in my work career now. Um, I, I'm more strongly attached to what I do. Uh, I used to work in medical research labs and while I really enjoyed doing the research and, and the thrill of discovery, uh, now I get to work with <coughs> multitudes of research labs and uh, try to make what they do better and safer for them. So uh, it's been very fulfilling. Has my life affected safety? <laughs> uh, not so much yet. <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> so hopefully as I continue along my career path, you know, I'll have more of an impact on the safety field. Um, you know, maybe one day be a biological safety officer at a large institution like Vanderbilt and affect a lot of lives. You want to pursue this some more? Could you do it by yeah, showing? Please, if you want. Well, I can sort of segue this. Um, uh, I'm going to show some pieces that deal with death. Um, but in going back to this most recent <coughs> comment or question you had, back in the early 90s, there was a terrible incident here with the art department where the school attacked a teacher for what he allowed to be shown in an art class. And the stuff was out of our own library. And it got to be a big brouhaha on a national level. It's written about in books now. And um, I got caught in the middle of that. But I started making art about institutions and secrecy and how they control people. And um, so now I'm in, what happened is it became this sort of, I fed off of the folly of the university, but it gave me more inspiration to make more art. So I was just trying to take, you know, making lemonade out of lemons. The, the piece I'm going to show you, there's basically two pieces that ended up as three pieces of work. Um, for about 15 years, I did art about death. Um, okay, um, what I discovered early on when writing about art is that the language you use in describing acts of creation is the same language you use to describe acts of destruction and violence. And it only works in English, it doesn't work in other languages. We execute a piece of art. We hang a painting. We shoot a photograph. We fire our clay. We have a piece of art, like something broken. So I just I would take simple word games like that and it, it, you know exploit them. But after a long time, I started getting into variations on this theme of death. Now I was asked by the University of Tennessee to do an outdoor piece, which I'd never done. This is kind of called Final Portrait Handicapped Person. It's 36 feet long, 12 feet wide. And um, it was an opportunity to do a large outdoor piece. It's probably the sickest thing I ever did, and the university didn't want me to do it because they thought people would be having sex in this grave that I made here. It's, it's a full-size grave with a handicap ramp. And I've got the aluminum grab bar in there, you know, the ubiquitous aluminum grab bar. But really, my message here was about, are we, are we all handicapped by our mortality? which I think is kind of a crazy question. And death is equally accessible to all of us. 
So I was going for something a little more philosophical, and the school just saw it as politically incorrect that I was making fun of the handicapped, <laughs> which I wasn't because my mother was confined to a wheelchair. She had Alzheimer's for 11 years. You know, I got a really bad gene pool. So I was always thinking about more mortality. Um, yeah, and it even had a drain. This had to last outside for a year, uh, and it drained throughout the year, and then I filled the hole up. Um, okay, now in 1984, um, I was a, a guest artist at this thing called Art Park. It was up near Niagara Falls, and I needed to make something simple because I was working outdoors. Now, this is called Final Self Portrait. This is a casket I made for myself, and it's based on a conversation I had with the guy who taught me woodworking. I said, James, when you die, what are you going to do with all your art? Because this guy was just <coughs> prolific. He says, I don't know. I don't care. You ever see a U-Haul behind a hearse? And that comment <laughs> stuck with me forever. So here's the casket. And funny things happen. When you see the arrows on that casket, what do the arrows mean? We're on the crate. Let me say, when you see arrows on a crate, in the context of death, though, it's like going to heaven. And then you get into the whole thing about death as a journey. That's especially with the trailer. <coughs> and the inside is my final exhibition. I physically fill up the floor space and the, the painters get all the wall space. It's sort of a joke about the art world. But uh, what happened, I got a lot of mileage out of that piece and it's people vandalize the hell out of it. So I started thinking, you know, what am I going to do with this piece? I can't show it anymore because it's so beat up. Well, I got asked to show it at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Atlanta. There was a show about artist's view of uh, time. And uh, so they offered $500 to anybody who'd be willing to do a performance based on their object. Now this kind of goes a little against the grain. You were talking about the inanimate object not being, uh, you know, your sweater, <coughs> not having the life and all this. Um, well, my question was, if art does have a life, who's got the right to take it? Sort of a euthanasia question. Because, I mean, you know, in, uh, in Judaism, if the Torah is desecrated, you have a service. And in, uh, I guess if the American flag is desecrated, you have a, some kind of service. You know, you sort of respect it as if it did have a life. So anyway, this is a shot from the inside of the museum. Now, that piece was 1984. This museum shows 2005. And I even had a headstone made because what I did is I built a whole, I did a performance. It was a full funeral for this piece. Uh, and, and the, and the uh, headstone says final self-portrait gives the dates last seen here. Um, so I had a band from Nashville go down to Atlanta and they played all these great songs like Amazing Grace and uh, Man of Constant Sorrow. I was mostly Christian, you know, I'll fly away uh, with the circle being broken. So they, they're playing there in the museum and they got everybody to surround the piece. Now the guy on the left is the head sculptor at Notre Dame. He's a, he's a real priest. And I flew him in to officiate the ceremony. <laughs> the woman signing the form is the museum director. The guy on the right is the one who curated the show. The girl in the back is one of my former students. I had all my former students in the Atlanta area come serve as pallbearers. Um, and then the priest read a pronouncement of death. Now, the question was, usually when an artist has the work destroyed, it's called destroyed. And it goes into a book, and you know when you have it printed in a book, you just put destroyed. But I wanted to have it called deceased. So we identified the moment of death, which was 6.52 p.m. on February 17th, and they all signed it as if they were official people. Okay, and then I did it like an ancient funeral. I had Professor Popovich on the left, and the woman in the middle is a distinguished professor at LaGrange College. And the one on, on the right uh, is one of the grand dames of the New Orleans art scene. She gave me my first show. But the ancient funerals used to have professional wailers, and they used to pull their hair and wail. And so they did a great job with that, and sort of a Mardi Gras. I mean, they were really good. I didn't realize how loud wailing can get. So, um, so here we are doing a taboo thing, dismantling an exhibition while it was on, because there were other people trying to show. So here we are moving the artwork to the, I converted my horse trailer into a purse. And here's, now the guy in the middle of the cowboy hat, he's the one that taught me woodworking. But here we are in the front of the museum, and I've got my purse. And the craziest part about it, and I didn't realize how crazy it was, I got the police in Atlanta to stop all the traffic for seven miles for an evening motorcade, which you never see a funeral at night. And uh, they stopped all the traffic all the way up to Buckhead. And I mean, really, 
buried it. Um, there's the priest. He's reading the rite of uh, committal, and there I'm standing there in the band. Is, they played Happy Trails as the casket was lowered into the, you know, into the Happy Trails to you until we meet again. No. I thought it worked better with a Christian thing, because at least you get sort of a second chance. You know, there's an afterlife. You know, with Judaism, it's game over. So that's it. Um, and I've got a parking meter there. You know, time's expired. And given the transportation thing with the old death thing. And there they are lowering the casket into the grave. And then everybody took a shovel of dirt, and we filled the hole. And a week later, I drove back to Atlanta, put the headstone in, cleaned up the, and that was that. So anyway, I, with the artwork, I don't think I solved, I end up just end, end up asking more questions. Like I've never resolved the issue that, how is it that people die in alphabetical order? You ever look at a newspaper when you read the obituary? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, you end up the question you can't answer. But anyway, this, this kind of stuff kept me occupied for a long time. So. say a word about that. Uh, I've learned one thing uh, out of philosophy. And that is to distinguish the things that matter from the things that don't matter. Now, I find that most of the things <coughs> that really bug me are things of no significance. Like for instance, uh, you have to go to, I have to go to a department meeting. <laughs> You go to a department meeting and you love your colleagues, but they're idiots. Amen. <laughs> and, and so, and so, so you say to yourself, you try, you, 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 you try to understand values better. And and I say to myself, is this a matter of significance? Should I be ruining my life because I look forward to this awful, awful event a week from now and? and Every day, I, I, and we're getting closer, and I can't stand it. Nothing to me. I walk in there. I carry a sandwich with some french fries. And I feel happy as a lark, because what happens there doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Now, there are some things in life that matter intensely. Friendships matter. Love matters, as you were saying. Uh, all kinds of things that we get involved in that, in that that specifically might hurt other people it matters tremendously. Uh, our love for our children, that really matters. But the rest of the shit, it just doesn't. You know, because it, it's, a, it's a, now, that is the outcome of my philosophy. And I love it. <laughs> um, very similar, I guess, from a different perspective coming, right? I mean, you, uh, you get into this academic world or any kind of business work in the world, you get sort of absorbed into things that really don't matter, right? I mean, you figure out you want to make a career, you get so obsessed with your little work of research and you get a hype out of it to some extent until you realize it doesn't really matter that much, right? You're planning ahead for whatever college funds you want to pay for your children. And so part of traveling around and working with people that didn't have the luxury in part, right? They didn't go to high school or any school whatsoever. But they found sort of this stability of just enjoying what they're doing at that moment and doing it right, living with their family, planting a tree, harvesting, when these little tiny things for us, right? Where it's like, okay, this is kind of boring stuff, right? I want to get a book published, I want to get famous or whatnot, ever. And eventually you kind of realize it doesn't really matter these things, right? I mean, so now here I am, published, working on my fifth book, and it's not exciting anymore. The first time around it was kind of fun, wow, it made me feel really cool. And then it's kind of like, okay, it's like having, it's like fixing a car, right? It's nice to know, and it's nice to do these things well, but you learn that it's of this process of doing these things well rather than waiting for an outcome, right? So it's not the postponing, I'm writing on a book, and the really cool thing is having the book. No, the really cool thing is writing the book. Once you're done, then the copy editing starts, and that really sucks big time. And so 
So you really, it's this process of doing things, figuring out what you want to do, and then doing that no matter the outcome, no matter whether it's, it's going to be a book or it's not going to be published. But so at that moment, just dedicate, figuring out what it is you want to do, and then just go for doing that part. Right? And not of thinking about, oh God, I would rather do this, I would rather do this. And I think that also is, is equilibrium to find this one, right? So instead of yeah, coming up with big bucket lists of what I want to do the next 10 years to really figuring out this is what I need to do now, and that's all there is, because who knows what that 10 years from is. Uh, um, it's a Jewish thing, I think, for me. Uh, and it's sort of ripping. <coughs> it's not that I'm disagreeing with my friend John. It's just a riff on what you said. Okay. I think what Jews are really good at is caring about things that don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the entire the entire Talmud is caring about things that really don't matter. And my parents were the same way. My mother could get pleasure out of folding paper. Just, you know, it's amazing. I learned from this of what it means to just take pleasure in everything, especially things that seem not to matter. And and that's that's you know that's such a mystery to be able to do that. It's a maybe it's a rare thing. I don't think so. I mean, I, I went to the Hendersonville Mall, and behind it is this fossil bed. You know, I mean, there are millions of, look at these beautiful fossils. <coughs> Nobody else cares about them. <laughs> Nobody. You don't, you don't care about them. <laughs> this is a perfect brachia, brachiopod from 470 million years ago. And there it was behind the shopping mall. And this is a piece of horn color, coral that was right near it. Nobody cares about these except me. And, and it's just such a pleasure to know that as well. Everyone cares about going to Kohl's or Target, right? But this, this is the mystery. It doesn't matter what it is. But the, the secret is there's always something behind the shopping mall. Always. <laughs> and you'll find it. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. I know it's a little bit over time, so you give a big round of applause.